Uh, we are produced by the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin, and joined by New York Times best-selling author, and now possibly Netflix most watched author, John Gilstrap. Good morning. Good morning. It's a jump, but I'm getting there one step so, at a time. And happy birthday to my baby boy, Chris. Oh, very nice. I'm old. 38. 38. Mm. Also, Bill Kearns, Executive Director of the Berkeley County Health Department. Morgan County is included in that as well. Billy. Good morning. It's great to be here if you fine gentlemen this morning. It is great to have you with us, sir. What are the hours of operation at the Berkeley Morgan County Health Department, Bill? We would be 830 to 430, Monday through Friday. Very nice. And your location? Um, we are at um, Martinsburg's office is at 122 Waverly Court. That's right off of Del Mar Orchard Road. And up in uh, Berkeley Springs, we're in the old hospital up there at 137 War Memorial Drive. Very nice. Now, we uh, obviously discussed in the previous segment from the legislative point of view with Senator Patricia Rucker and the unfortunate death of Kennedy Miller, who is a homeschool student. Uh, Roy Ramey joins us now. He is the president of the West Virginia uh, Home uh, Educators Association in uh, the state. Uh, Roy, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. How are you today? Great, thank you. And if that name is familiar to you, Roy ran for agricultural commissioner in the last election and the previous one as well. Uh, Roy, I'm not sure if you caught the segment with Senator Rucker or, or not, uh, but uh, I want to get your perspective on this situation with Kennedy Miller and whether or not home education needs more scrutiny in the aftermath of this tragedy. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on and giving me the opportunity to discuss this. Uh, I've been a homeschool dad for uh, many years now. Uh, my daughter is 15, and we have always homeschooled her. She's never been in government school at all. And uh, I've been uh, a, a big advocate of high-quality education, uh, even since I was young myself. And uh, I'm actively involved in the homeschooling community to help educate others on uh, how they can educate their own children and uh, provide a good quality education and get resources that they might not be able to get in a cookie cutter situation as we have with the government school. And so um, uh, so that kind of brings me uh, here. Uh, I've advocated for several years with uh, the West Virginia Home Educators Association, which is an organization to help uh, uh, increase freedom for homeschool rights and uh, educate the people on what their responsibility is to follow the law. Roy, again, in the aftermath of the Kennedy Miller situation, do you feel that the homeschooling arrangements that we have right now in West Virginia need to be further regulated or further examined? Uh, yeah, so... Uh, I don't believe it does. Uh, you know, and, and to be fair, uh, you know, the Kennedy Miller death was a huge tragedy. Uh, my heart aches for, uh, for her and for her family who have lost her. Uh, but in fact, this isn't even a homeschooling problem. Uh, I'm sure maybe uh, many of your listeners uh, watched the uh, press conference that was done uh, last week uh, by the governor's office. And uh, I listened to many, many facts on there that, in fact, were, uh, were falsely stated. Uh, just from the perspective that I had. So when I know how many things were falsely said, I've got to question everything else that was said, uh, and particularly uh, it regarded uh, things that were stated by the superintendent uh, about homeschooling law, and there were at least five major things that were wrong. Uh, so uh, we do not need more Can you expound on that? Uh, in fact, uh, yes, sir. Uh, so one of the things that uh, that was said was that uh, homeschooling assessments are optional. Uh, and then uh, they stated that the, the assessment is only every three years. And there were a few other things. Uh, I've got some notes on it, uh, uh, you know, about how many things were said wrong. But those were just a couple of examples. And, in fact, uh, assessments are not optional. Uh, they have to be done every year. Uh, and they have to be turned in on the, the years for the 3rd, 5th, 8th, and 11th grade years to the local county board of education. And uh, you have to keep those documents for a minimum of three years in your own records uh, as evidence if you ever get questioned about what you've done and, and what you're doing for your homeschool uh, to have those records on file 
and you may even have to go to a court of law if uh, if you're ever challenged that you're not following the law. The remedy is that the Board of Education could bring charges against you as a homeschooler, uh, take you to court, and as our system is designed, a judge will make a decision on that. Uh, it's not a it's not a bureaucrat without due process, and obviously, you know, due process is a critical thing. Uh, in fact, this entire case had nothing to do with homeschooling, and it could have happened to somebody that wasn't a homeschool family, for that matter. The uh, uh, you know, this is simply uh, not that it's simple, but it's a child neglect case, uh, possibly child abuse, and we have laws against those. We have laws against murder, uh, manslaughter, you know, in any way that we uh, bring death or harm to another person. We already have laws for that. And as is happening, the one thing that was said accurately in that whole press conference was that uh, this is a criminal case that's been referred to the courts and is now in the court system, and those parents uh, will hopefully get the due process uh, that they they have rights to that due process. They're still uh, not convicted yet, so you know we we can't say for certain that they're at fault, but we believe they're at fault, and the proper authorities have brought charges against them. So that is where the fault lies, and this is a people problem, not a process problem. So there's a, there are a few facts, that are real facts. Roy, are, are there any consequences for homeschool parents whose kids? Do not turn in the appropriate paperwork to make sure that they are on grade or achieving a level that is equivalent to what would be considered on grade? Yes. So the law, which is uh, all under the compulsory attendance law, it's uh, code 18-8-1 uh, of the state code, and it specifies in there uh, where you have to turn those in that if it's not turned in, the Board of Education may bring charges against the family for against the parents, in particular, who registered for homeschooling to start with, uh, to challenge that. And it says may for a few good reasons. Uh, the uh, the individuals involved might be known to the school, or they might not be known. And if they're known to the school, and you know they are making an effort, maybe they've had struggles or whatever. It allows those officials in the Board of Education to have that flexibility uh, to say, you know what, uh, we know these people are, are trying. We know that they're, uh, they had this problem or that problem because we know them in the community, and it's not a case of them just simply neglecting to conduct homeschool. Uh, and, you know, so in that case, they may decide not to bring charges. Or if they don't know, they should follow up and investigate, and we seem to have lost uh, the critical thinking ability to properly investigate and follow up on something. And then if they determine that there's actually some cause here, then they should bring it to the courts. But that is spelled out in the law, and uh, the, uh, the school officials just need to follow that law, and quite often it's not followed. And that is where we have a breakdown and a failure. Uh, it's not that we need more laws. Uh, people just need to follow the laws that we already have, and we wouldn't have this problem. So, Roy, I um, I appreciate you being on here this morning. This is Bill. I um, I think we need to not hang our hat on the fact that this is that this was a homeschooled child. I mean, it, it, that's fact, and it's not homeschooling of children that has failed. It's um, the fact is, it, you know, it is neglect. It's a pure case of neglect, um, and that does need to be taken care of in the court system. Um, unfortunately, there's a, a lot of parents and grandparents out there that are very neglectful to their children and grandchildren. Um, what, in your opinion, could have been done better to have stopped the situation or have alleviated it anyway? Well, there's several things, uh, and again, you know, how much of these are facts? We've heard the press conference, and, and we know what we think are facts, but but as they were stated, a, a state trooper had come to the House in, uh, I believe it was March of 23, and, uh, and physically, uh, you know, reported that physically the girl seemed fine, uh, but had some concerns uh, about her views toward COVID, and uh, reported that to the local 
office of CPS, and apparently that was never followed up on. Uh, now, you know, there's an allegation that, uh, you know, did he use the 800 number or whatever. Uh, as uh, some other folks have said, the 800 number is m- merely a means of communication uh, for those who might be anonymous or don't know where to go. Uh, this is a, another individual who's uh, charged and has authority within our, so- uh, our society and knows other resources within that same system. In other words, he knows how to get a hold of CPS uh, officials directly, and he did that because he had knowledge of where their office is and who they were and went to tell them direct. Uh, so, you know, should he be held accountable for not using one method of communication versus another? Uh, you know, I don't know that he does, but apparently he made that communication, reported it, and the CPS officials did not follow up on it. And for a time, they even denied even having any such report. Uh, so now you've got uh, a problem within the CPS office of uh, losing track of their own reporting mechanism uh, and what's happened here and there. Does that kind of thing happen? Uh, yes, I'm sure it does. Uh, you know, I served in the military for 33 years, and uh, we certainly make mistakes, and we make uh, decisions every day on priorities for that given day and sometimes that given moment, and sometimes things fall through the cracks. Unfortunately, this was a very serious one that fell through the cracks, and I believe if they would have followed up on that matter uh, to get with the girl, uh, to interview her, uh, maybe to set up follow-up visits uh, to check on her, then this may not have happened. Uh, But as you said, it's absolutely not because she was being homeschooled. You know, we have students who are in the government school system that are home for about three months out of the summer. Uh, Who's watching their progress? Uh, Who's watching all the kids that are being harmed that are in the government schools? That happens every day. Uh, Just, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, uh, there were reports about uh, two teachers. It was in another state, but I, I see these kind of reports all the time. Uh, two teachers who were um, soliciting two teenage boys in their classes. Uh, these, these were high school boys, and uh, there was a big incident over that. Well, what kind of harm is happening to the people in the schools? And they're seen by these teachers every day. So this isn't a homeschool issue. Uh, this is a people problem, uh, and we have policies and, and laws in this case that already cover those things. So, Roy, this is John Gilstrap. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. Um, I, I, Good there's morning. an undercurrent I sense that's happening here. Um, Senator Rucker was just on and, and uh, talking about the CPS issues that were happening. And with all the moving parts that seem to have broken in this tragedy with Kennedy Miller, uh, how do you think this got packaged into the – Homeschool. Homeschooling is is the issue. But given all the stuff that's going, how did it end up landing on the plate of, of homeschooling? Yeah, uh, and that's probably one of the most important questions that's been asked this morning and in, in a lot of uh, the different discussions here. And I'm big on root cause analysis. I've done a lot of investigations and uh, a lot of inspections. That's in my past, too. Ooh. And so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so you always look at not just what's the problem on the surface, but what's the root cause. And I really believe that the root cause in this is that homeschoolers are leaving the government school system in droves, which is affecting funding. And ultimately, the school officials and other government officials that see the funding going to that uh, is dwindling. And uh, in some cases, this is going to Hope Scholarship. I don't believe that's the case with this family. Uh, but nevertheless, some of that money is, uh, is going away uh, and transitioning into the Hope program. And in other cases, it's just not there at all. You know, folks that are not in the Hope and that have never been in it, they're just a tr- what we call a traditional homeschooler. Uh, you know, there's no money in the system at all for that. And these officials are feeling threatened that their empire is crumbling And in fact, it's a matter of right-sizing the money to the number of kids in the system. Uh, You know, as with anything, if you don't have usage of a system, then you shouldn't put a lot of money in that system. And our usage is dwindling, 
that means we're going to have fewer teachers that are needed, fewer uh, bus drivers, you know, and all the staff and, and folks that are needed to operate a school system. Uh, there's a proportional dwindling of that. To include administrators, administrators are the big ones because they're the they're the folks that manage all this money, and they see it from the top. So I believe that the root cause revolves around the uh, the money uh, cut on the school system, and they're feeling threatened and want to do anything they can to make it hard on homeschoolers or potential homeschoolers because if it's easy, you're going to go out and do something. If something's not easy, then you're going to avoid doing that thing. And it's, you know, West Virginia is one of those states where we have a lot more freedom than we used to have, and we've fought hard over several decades now to get where we're at. Uh, but West Virginia is one of the heaviest regulated states in homeschooling, and uh, we don't need more regulations. But uh, it's it's doable, and those who want to do it can find a way to make it happen. So uh, that's really the root cause. Well, let me and, let me uh, there, let play devil's advocate here a little bit. Those are some pretty strong words going on there. Is it possible that the concern really is that when kids go to school every day, there's a teacher and there are folks in the hallway that can see the condition of the kids and kind of keep track of them, if only passively, um, whereas homeschoolers, they don't get that check. So there can be daily abuse that's going on that really there's no accountability for it. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely a possibility. Uh, but what happens with all the kids who are in the government school that are being abused by school officials, whether it's, uh, you know, teachers or administrators or other staff, uh, I see reports of that all the time, and many of those people are not held accountable. In the case of the teachers that I mentioned uh, previously, uh, those teachers simply resigned. They didn't get fired. Uh, they've still got their pension uh, all secured. They'll probably move over to a school in the next school district and get a job and possibly continue the same pattern. And we've seen that thing uh, right here in our own state. So, uh, you know, we can say that somebody is, is seen. Uh, you know, what about the, the mental and emotional abuse? That's, you know, that's not physical. You're not going to see marks on a child from that. And you could end up missing that. What about in the case I previously mentioned for three months uh, that students are at home uh, or uh, a few weeks that they're at home, uh, you know, it, like Christmas break, for instance. Uh, there's plenty of times that students are at home with their parents that there's nobody else potentially watching them. And, you know, that's where neighbors come in. Uh, that's where people in church come in. You know, if you go to church and your kids are, uh, are seen by others, uh, you've got a good community and network there. You go to ball fields with uh, Little League maybe. You know, so we encourage kids to get out and parents to take their kids and be involved in other activities. Does it happen that some kids now are are stuck away in a home and they don't go anywhere? Yes, it does. This was one of those cases. And, and unfortunately, it's tragic, uh, as we've said. But we can't make a nanny state out of everybody because of a few isolated cases. And this is a very isolated, rare incident. And uh, we should not change our whole legal system because of one incident. We have laws in place already to protect folks. We just need to follow the laws that we already have. Roy, that's a lot of whatabouts uh, in there. And I have, I have many friends who have homeschooled their kids with great success. Those kids went on to do great things, college and, and on in, in the private sector or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's idiots in every field. We know that. Uh, for yep. the for the most part, when your kid goes to school, the teacher doesn't abuse your kid. And for the most part, when your kid is homeschooled, the parents aren't abusing the kid. But there are idiots out there, and these things do happen. Uh, I'm a high school football coach, and one of the things that I am as a result of that is I'm a mandatory reporter. So if I see a kid who looks abused or a kid says something to me that indicates abuse, I am uh, by law required to report that or, or I am liable and culpable for not reporting it. Are there home school personal welfare checks that are in place already that are carried out on a regular basis? Because when I'm, in, when I'm at the school, I can see the kid, as John Gilstrap alluded to a moment ago. 
If the kid's at home, mm-hmm. I can't see the kid. I have to trust that everything is fine. And we don't want a nanny state, but are there any types of home uh, school personal welfare checks that do take place during the school year? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, you know, in many cases, uh, homeschoolers don't do this alone, uh, as, as I alluded to before. Uh, we have co-ops for homeschoolers. Uh, they're involved in uh, church activities, uh, Little League, uh, you know, and other athletics. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunities to get out in the community, and we highly encourage that. But it is not required by law. And in my estimation, we don't need more laws to require that. What about the elderly person? That uh, that doesn't get out in the community anymore, and well, Roy, I don't, I don't want to do what abouts, Roy, Roy, because we can pick apart every <laughs> single argument ever made on this earth with a what about. We, we, but that doesn't reduce the validity Absolutely. of what should be required, or at least uh, be thought about or considered. Uh, how many homeschool students are there in West Virginia, Roy? Do you know? We have roughly twenty six thousand. Uh, and there are some estimates somewhere between 25 and 30,000. Uh, it's, it's hard to get an exact number because the state doesn't seem to uh, to have an exact number, an accurate number. So it's an estimate in that range. Do we have any idea academically how they compare to the kids that are in the public schools, traditional public schools? Yes, uh, we know that in general, uh, and again, we don't get specifics for each child, uh, those are uh, those are kept within each of the school districts and and are apparently confidential. Uh, but uh, we know in general, and my personal experience from getting all around the state with homeschooling, is that these kids do very much better than their government school counterparts. Uh, and, and as you said, you know many of them are going into college. They're going into uh, good, high-paying professional jobs. Uh, they get prestigious honors. And uh, and so at a very high rate, they are doing far better uh, than their counterparts. You know, on the flip side of that, uh, we have some folks who uh, maybe don't do so well. Uh, they might have medical conditions that would otherwise keep them from going to government school. Uh, they might have some kind of other issue where they just wouldn't do government school. And uh, it's better for them to have an ind- individualized program at home where they can get the specific attention they need, and they would actually be lost in the crowd uh, if they had went to school, whereas, uh, you know, they're they're getting the attention they need, but they might not thrive per se like we think of as the average kid, you know, whether they're in government school or home school. Uh, and, you know, it's important for them to get the best attention they can uh, so that they can... Uh, they can do the best they can for their given situation. Roy, I want to thank you very much for your time on the program here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And just want to reiterate that, uh, you know, this is a people problem, not a policy problem. We don't need more laws. We just need to follow the laws that we already have. And uh, more laws would not have fixed this problem. Uh, It just, it wouldn't have. Thank you, Roy. Thank you for having me on.